الحمد لله بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على سيد وحبيب رسول الله وعلى آله وصحابته ومن والاه الحمد لله نحمد الله سبحانه وتعالى ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له وصرواته والسلام على أفضل خلق الله على سيد وحبيب رسول الله وعلى آله وصحابته أجمعين آمين يا رب العالمين اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين اللهم سهل علينا وافتح علينا في هذه العلوم الحمد لله بسم الله first of all السلام uh, عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and uh, رمضان مبارك to uh, everyone the people present but also people that are coming in uh, on these these uh, wondrous uh, tools that we have Alhamdulillah, from I think inshallah, arjum min Allah and yukun min at tawfiq. I wanted to do uh, some of Imam al Bukhari's uh, collection because traditionally it was something that actually was done in Ramadan. Uh, in many places, they did a khatam of Sahih al Bukhari alongside uh, their khatamat of the Quran. And it's still done in Medina, um, and I've attended. Uh, uh, their uh, the sessions in Ramadan, the uh, the Ba'alwi clan still do the khatam uh, in the Rawda uh, during uh, the month of Ramadan, and so I noticed the the person that I had read uh, the text um, with and who uh, put me in the chain of transmission was Sheikh Muhammad Yaqubi, who's actually doing also a um, thirty um, sessions. I'm I'm uh, doing uh, much less than that, but he's doing thirty sessions much greater scholar, um, but he, uh, he's uh, one of the, uh, the people of Isnad of this time. Uh, he's a brilliant scholar that we were fortunate to have here at Zaytun, and he actually did a khatam of Sahir Bukhari in, uh, in Az- Az- Zaytuna many years ago and uh, gave the chain of Isnad to the students that attended that. The uh, Sahir Bukhari, is, is, it, it holds a special place in the community for a number of reasons. And, but I think what's uh, very interesting is that the, the tradition in which led up to uh, somebody like Imam al-Bukhari was a very organic uh, tradition. It was not something that was done with any um, type of organizational structure like setting up schools and colleges and... and uh, creating sciences. If you, if you look at the early Islamic period, one of the miracles of this religion is how natural all of our uh, disciplines evolved. And one of the secrets of, of, of uh, our tradition, I think it's one of the core secrets, is the Isnad tradition. Because unlike Christianity that had uh, went through very disruptive periods, because you had so many different views of Christianity. And so what would happen is they would have these councils and they would come together, like the Council of Nicaea is a very famous council that occurred in Turkey, uh, where they determined that, and this is 325 years after uh, the the beginning of the Christian era, where they determined that God really was three. So it's, uh, it's very interesting that it, it took them that long to kind of agree on that as a doctrine. Um, but, and what's interesting also is that Nicaea was destroyed by an earthquake uh, not long after that, so, which is mentioned in the Quran, that by, just by saying that God is three, it, this, the earth would almost split from saying that. In any case, the Muslims never had, as far as we can tell from our history, they never had any councils, they never had any of these majami which they have today, like Majam al Fakhia, they come together. There's no indication that they had those. What they did have was they had authorities, and these authorities emerged uh, organically also. Uh, they would be recognized by the, uh, the community. So a really good example of that, and I'm gonna use somebody uh, close to my heart. I could use any of the imams, the great imams of our tradition, but a really good example of that is Imam Malik ibn Anas. So Imam Malik who was born 
in, into around, probably around 93. He's born into this slight difference of opinion when he came in, but about 93 years after the Hijrah. He's born in Medina, and he's born at a time where there are still some uh, tabi'in alive uh, and tabi'a tabi'in. Whether he's from which group uh, is the majority say he's from the tabi'a tabi'in. But in any case, when he was born, they were still alive. There were people f who had lived with the Sahaba. And Imam Madik, he basically, he, he was from a, a, a very distinguished line. Uh, he was a Yemeni from the Asbah, uh, a well-known uh, Yemeni clan. And, and uh, he, 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 his family was relatively poor, but he has a, a good lineage, and his grandfather was one of the Sahaba. So his mother, who uh, raised him and early on wanted him to become a scholar, she would literally tie his turban for him when he was very little and send him. And uh, as he began to grow, um, it was clear that he had a level of intelligence was, that was uh, extraordinary, really almost supernatural. And he studied with some of the most important teachers in Medina amongst these uh, tabi, tabi, uh, the tabi'in. Sorry, the tabi'in. So he, he basically, um, he, he studied with uh, Imam Zuhri as one of the major ones. Uh, uh, Muhammad bin Shihab al-Zuhri, who's really one of the great and early uh, Hadith scholars. He has what they call suhuf. So they begin to write these suhuf. The suhuf are basically ad hoc collections of Hadith that were written down. And Abu Huraira begins this, and some of the Sahaba, there were other Sahaba also that wrote down the Hadith. Initially, there are Hadiths that the Prophet Sallallahu said not to write them down. But it was in the early period when the Quran was still being revealed and the Prophet Sallallahu was concerned that they would mix the two. So later he actually tells in, a, in about uh, being asked about the memory, he said, Asta'im bi yaminik, in other words, write them down. So the Hadiths are written down. Uh, Abu Huraira, who initially did not write them down, then began to write them down. He actually had multiple suhuf, and he collected, he, he, he relates uh, over 5,000 hadith. So he's, he's relating about 5,300 hadith. One of the criticisms in the Shia community was he was only with the Prophet for uh, almost around two years. And so they say, if you just look at the number of hadith that he relates, how could he relate so many hadith? But Abu Huraira was collecting hadith. He wasn't just hearing them directly from the Prophet. He was getting them from other people because Sahaba can relate hadith from other Sahaba without mentioning the Sahabi. So, so it's not necessarily that he heard all of them from the Prophet Sallallahu but he is considered a thiqqa, uh, a sound uh, narrator. And so he begins... Uh, to he's collecting these hadiths, and then uh, the uh, the next phase after the suhuf is the musannafat. So these are uh, these are collected. They're they're organized, and they're usually organized topically. And the first and most famous one is the musannaf uh, that's called the al muwatta. So the muwatta bi Malik is really the first collection. It's the first book after the Quran in the Arabian tradition. So the Quran is the very first book uh, in, in Arab history. There's no, there's no book before the Quran that we have. The next book really is the Muwatta of Imam Malik. So when you think about a civilization, the two foundational texts are the Quran and the Hadith. Uh, it's quite stunning. Even though Imam Malik, his book which has 1,720 uh, hadith in the Yahya ibn Yahya al-Layth recension, which came from Andrusia. Only the, there's just over 500 that are actually directly from the Prophet uh, hadith. Other ones are the opinions of uh, some of the Tabi'in, some of the Sahaba, and even Madik himself. So it's not entirely a collection of hadith, even though it's considered uh, part of the canon of the hadith tradition. So the Musannafat then begin, and then you have one of the students of Imam Malik, Abdul Razak al-Sanani, uh, makes a much bigger Musannaf. 
and Ibn Abi Shayba, who's his student. So you have these musannafat. But the actual um, rigor was, was not in the musannafat. The muwatta is proven by Ibn Abd al-Barr later to be, because Imam Malik has uh, these marasil, he has hadiths uh, that are, uh, th there's a, a, a break in the chain. And so, uh, but Ibn Abd al-Barr shows how all of them were, um, were actually sound, which proves that Imam Malik uh, knew his, the people that he was relating from. But the Musannafat did not have that type of rigor. And so it was Imam uh, al-Bukhari's teacher who said to him, and Imam al-Bukhari was very young at this time, he said to him that he wished that, so that somebody would write uh, only the Sahih hadith, only the hadith that have been absolutely confirmed and without any um, doubt in them. And so Imam al-Bukhari initially, um, I mean obviously he planted the seed in his head, but he had a dream in which the Prophet ﷺ was there and Imam al-Bukhari had a fan and he was fanning away like things from the Prophet that would bother him. And so he went to one of the Mu'abbirin and he asked him what, what, it, what, what it meant and he said, you're going to remove lies that people claim that the Prophet ﷺ, things they, they claim he said. So you're going to, in the same way Abu Hanifa had a famous, uh, uh, he saw the Prophet the, the grave and he saw the bones and then he, they weren't assembled properly and he put them together. That was a sign that, of the type fiqh that he would create. So these were deeply spiritual people that were having amazing dreams uh, in, in which a lot of signs would come to them. So, the, uh, so Imam al-Bukhari begins to write his sahih, but even before that, he, he's, he's a miracle child, he's born in Bukhara, um, and when, when he was born, he, uh, his, his mother, he actually went, she had a dream uh, that, um, because he went blind, that he would be cured of his blindness, and then she dedicated him to, uh, to learning. So he had, he, he had initially a sickness where he lost his sight and then his sight came back. He could, anything he could hear, he could memorize. He, he just had a, a completely photographic memory. So anything that he could hear. And modern people have a very difficult time because uh, many of you, when you're uh, young, uh, probably in school, they did what was called telephone. Does anybody remember that? Did you have to do that? So, so they have in the classroom, the teacher writes something and then the child, uh, they, they look at it, but then they can't, they can't pass it on. They just whisper into the ear of the student and the next student whispers into the ear until it goes through the whole class. It all, everybody laughs at the end because it's always completely mangled. So it's completely a different, um, uh, what was the teacher had originally written. And what they want to show you is how unreliable transmission is. I mean, that's the idea behind it. Well, that's the very point of this tradition, is to make sure only reliable people. Because I guarantee if you took uh, 50 Mauritanians who studied in this, or, or even in Sus in Al Maghrib, these students of the Madrasa tradition, and you did the same thing on, on, with them, it would be the same at the end of the chain. And, and, and that's simply, uh, anybody who's seen this, I mean, there's a famous story of Wudu Mayab, I think, where, uh, in, when he was in Mali, he saw two people get into a fight and they spoke Bambara. And uh, uh, one of them ended up uh, getting killed. So the police, they wanted to know what, how, who started the fight. And, he didn't know the language, but he was able to say what each one of them said just from hearing it. Um, there's many stories of that in our tradition. So Imam Bukhari, when he went to Baghdad, for instance, they mangled up all of the riwayat. Uh, so, so you have the metan, which is the hadith, the actual content of the hadith, and then you have the senad, or the chain, or the isnad, it's also called. So what they did was they took all these hadiths, each one took 10, each one of the sheikhs took 10, and they would 
mangle the hadith and they would put the wrong chains, they'd mix up the chains and then put the wrong chains with the metan. So they wanted to test him. And so when, when he came to Baghdad, and he was tested in Basra as well, uh, in different places. This was something the ulama did. Um, so, so when they tested him, he listened to the first man do his, and each one he just said, La arifuhu. I don't, I, I don't know that hadith. And then the next one, he said, La arifuhu. And then the next one, La arifuhu. So they started thinking he doesn't know anything because he's not even correcting them. And so they, they actually begin to wonder who, if this man is who people say he is. So when they all finished, he, he said, are you done? And he said, yes. He said, um, the first one, and then he actually gave the correction. To, he said, this is the correct chain. And he get, did all 10, then the next, and then the next, until he finished the 100 hadith. And he corrected all of them. After hearing them recited, he knew both the wrong recitation and then he corrected each one. And at that point, they surrendered to him as the, the hafil of his time. So he, he had this prodigious memory, uh, but he was also a faqih. And one of the things about the sahih is that he, he has, he has uh, yatasarraf. So he'll actually bring insights into these things. There's also, if you look at some of the hadith, like for instance, in the chapter on the prohibition of, of killing with fire, he has the hadith of, of Imam Ali from Palestine. So what he's showing in that is that he knows the hadith and, and, and he doesn't accept you know, the hukum of that hadith. Um, he does this very often in the book. He also, according to the tradition, for every single hadith that he narrates, he, he did istikhara and he uh, prayed two rakats. And many of them he did in the haram. He was in Mecca and Medina. And he traveled to many places to get hadith. So he's just an extraordinary person. When he went to, uh, to um, Samarqand, uh, to, uh, they, they said for, for um, they came out about more than 12 miles to greet him, like throngs of people. This is how, uh, one, it's how respected knowledge was. Like people really respected knowledge. So they would come out. And traditionally, people would come out to greet uh, wufud and things like that. It's just part of the Islamic tradition. The wuft is like a, um, uh, it's a good translation for wuft. Delegation, yeah, like a delegation or a group of people that are traveling for some purpose. So Imam al-Bukhari, uh, uh, one of the things that they said, don't ask him about um, lafz al-Qur'an. Is it makhluq or not makhluq? Because there was a big fitna at that time. And uh, so when they got in, uh, the first day everything went fine, second day went fine. And on the third day, one, somebody asked him, like, what do you say about Lafz al Quran? And he said, You know, to utter is from the actions of a human being and the actions are created. So then they went, Oh, he's saying Quran is created. So it created a fitna for him. Um, and, and, and then he said, Oh, so you're saying the Quran is created? He said, No, Quran is not And he said, What is the bid'ah? But to test people like this is a bid'ah. Because that's what a lot of people like to do. They want to just suss you out to, see, to, put, to put you into some kind of box. So they'll ask you, oh, what do you say about this? What do you say about that? What do you say about that? And they're really, they're really trying to catch you out. And that is a bid'ah. So, um, so he, it took him 16 years to put this book together. Um, there's 97 chapters. It has over 7,000 hadith, but there are several uh, that are mukarrar. Uh, it's often not with the same chain, but they, they, they're replicated. And so he, he basically has about 4,000 that aren't, and uh, over 2,000 that are uh, directly from the Prophet Wasallam. So then he had a student, Imam Muslim. Imam Muslim, uh, 
does the same thing that Imam al-Bukhari does. He does a, a, a collection of Sahih Hadith. He's only going to get the Sahih. But he had a criteria, criterion that differed from Imam al-Bukhari. So in the Hadith, uh, you know, there's five conditions for a, a Sahih Hadith, right? Uh, and, and so the, it has to be muttasal. The isnad has to be muttasal. Uh, the, the, so the chain can't have any breaks in it because if it has a break in it like a mawquf uh, if, if, if a sahabi relates it and doesn't mention the Prophet it might have the hukum of rafa in other words it's considered a hadith because they, if they're saying something that could not be said except from revelation so for instance in the hadith that um, man sama uh, so that is موقوف عن الصحابي. So the Sahabi that related that, he couldn't say that without having heard something from the Prophet to say that to fast on the day of death. So the, the, the day of doubt is the 29th, um, the 30th uh, day. The 29th, you go out on the 29th, uh, at the end of the 29th day, to see if there's a new moon. If you don't see the new moon, it might have been born, but you don't know because there could be ghaim. So the Prophet said, in ghumma alaykum, in ghubi alaykum, fa'akmilu al-iddata thirathina, right? So complete 30 days of Sha'ban, if, 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 it is, if it's obscured for some reason. So that's an example of a hadith that's mawquf, on the Sahabi. Another one is Mustawr al Qurashi in, in Sahih Muslim in Bab al Fitan relates a hadith about the people of, of uh, the Europeans, Ar Rom. Ibn Abd al Bar says Ar Rom refers to the Europeans and he, he calls them Ben al Asfar, the, basically the white people. So he said all the hadiths that relate to that. He has a section in his Rasail on the different uh, groups. Um, so and he divides Rome into the old Rome and the new Rome. So the old Rome is Yunnan. And Yunnan was actually the name of uh, one of the, uh, he goes back to Sayyidina Nuh, according to our tradition. So Yunnan is Greece, but he's actually, and then the new Rome is the, the Latin Romans, which is when they, they found Rome, according to their tradition, is found by um, Aeneas, who's a survivor of, old, you know, of, of, uh, of uh, the Trojan War. So that's New Rome. So in the Hadith it says, تَقُمَ السَّعَةُ وَالرَّوْمُ أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ The end of time won't come until the Europeans are the majority of people. In the comments, and Qadiman, in the comments they said, it's not the Adad, it's Tashabbuh. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمًا فَهُمْ Whoever resembles a people is one of them. So in the end of time, the majority of people will be imitating Europeans in their dress, in their food, in their, in their culture, right? It becomes like a monoculture. And that's the Sahih Hadith. تَقُومَ السَّعَةُ وَالرَّوْمُ أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ The hour doesn't come until the Europeans are the majority of people. تَشَبُّهًا So when... Uh, Amr ibn al-As heard Mustawrad recite that. He said, Anzar ma taqul. Think about what you're saying. He said, Sumatu min Rasulillah. I heard it from the press. Then he says, uh, If that's the case, Inna fihim la la arba'u khisal. They have, Inna fihim la arba'u khisal. They have in them four qualities. And then he mentions these four qualities in the fifth one. Is that mawquf or not? It could be mawquf because. Imam Sunusi says the Romans didn't have those qualities. The Europeans did not have those qualities at his time. So was that mawquf, is he talking about, did he hear that from the Prophet that the qualities that they would have would be those qualities? So there's an example where there's some khilaf about whether it has hukum al rafa whether it's actually from the Prophet, but it is in the fitan of the end of time. That's where Imam Muslim put that uh, section. So... Uh, so it's awaluhu sahihu wa huma tasu ma tasal isnaduhu wa lam yashid aw yashud 
ولم يعال. It doesn't have, it's not shad. So one reciter uh, recites a narration that differs from other thiqat. So in that case, it's considered like shad. It's, it has an irregularity. So that, that it, might, it might be a, a sound hadith, but it's not, doesn't have the, the uh, it doesn't have the saha. It doesn't get the, you can't give it the stamp that it's sahih because of that. Or it has ilal. And these are the defects of the hadith that are known in the science. And that's a science that goes into the mustarahat al-hadith and the types of ilal. You have different types of ilal um, uh, in hadith. So, uh, and then, yarwihi adlun dabitun an mithrihi. So, the, the, the adl relates the hadith. These are the criteria for the hadith. The adl relates the hadith. So, what is an adl in our tradition? According to the people of hadith, the way they look at it is they have to have malaka uh, that, uh, that, um, that they have mulazamat al taqwa wal muru'a. So, they have both taqwa and they also have muru'a. So taqwa is وَحَسُرُ التَّقْوَ إِجْتِنَابُ مِمْتِثَادِ فِي ظَاهِرٌ وَبَاطِنٌ بِذَا تُنَالٌ That the, Ibn Ashur says taqwa is to do, uh, to do what we've been commanded to do inwardly and outwardly and to avoid what we've been prohibited inwardly and outwardly. So that's a person of taqwa. The highest degree of taqwa, there's five degrees according to the ulama. Ibn Juzay uh, records those five degrees. Um, the least of which is somebody fears the kaba'ir, the highest of which they even fear uh, you know, anything other than being in the divine presence. So the, the adal is somebody who's just, and then they, they have muru'a, which means that they, they have the character, the ethical character of decent people. They'll, they'll you know, kafal adha an al akharin, they don't harm people. They have sitq al lisan. They don't do anything that would be inappropriate, uh, break the decorum of a culture. So, for instance, if if the if in in uh, in Andalusia it was not the urf of the Andalusians to wear head coverings. So, a man who did not wear a head covering did not affect his shahada. Right, he, his testimony of being upright and just. But in in, in other places, in the East, it did. So if you didn't wear, if you were a male and you went out without your head covered, that would actually affect your status because you were doing so, or if you were known to eat uh, in public places. Um, many, many things could do this. So there's an element to this that is a bit relative because it relates to al-urf uh, wal-ada, right? So the ada is muhakkama, like the ada of a people. And the same with... Uh, you know, uh, uh, I- I- relations, you know, with, uh, between the sexes. D- cultures have different urf with this. So in some cultures, it's very strict segregation. In others, it's not. So in a culture where it was very strict segregation, if someone was known to mix, then they, 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 they would lose that status. So this is, there's, there's an element to this that has to do with urf. But generally, that, that's the... And then Dabit is somebody who's very precise. So they're very precise. So they don't... Like those of us who don't have these prodigious memories, uh, we might uh, relate a hadith, but we might miss a word or we use another word that, which is permitted, according to the Ummah, to re- relate with meaning. But it, you're not Dabit. And so you're not a Sahih transmitter. You have to have dabt. Mu'tamidun fi dabtihi wa naqlihi. You have to be trustworthy in your dabt, in that you got the hadith right, and then in also your naql. Now, the, after the early period, because these books were written down, if, you ha- if the teacher had a solid collection and they, they could transmit the hadith from Imam Madik, for instance, his, his son Yahya did not take hadith from him, but his daughter Fatima did. And he, and he used to have his daughter uh, would, behind a curtain, would actually make corrections for the reciters when they were reading the Muatta with him. So she would actually correct, because Imam Madik would be listening, but it was Fatima that would make the corrections. So, um, and then the Ijaza tradition comes out of this, where they, they basically give uh, the ijaza 
And initially, Ijaz was very rigorous. Later, when the books became written down, because by the, uh, Imam al-Bukhari dies in 256, so by that time, most of the hadith had, had been written down, but they continue on until the 11th century. So you have later in the, in the 5th century, you have people like um, uh, Imam al-Bayhaqi uh, and Abu Nu'im, uh, who are doing major collections. al Behaqi's collection is a major collection. So by that time, they've really exhausted the hadith, that you could not, uh, you couldn't really find hadith after that period. And then there's amazing collections of the hadith, where like Mishkat al-Masabiyah, it's very important by Tab Tabrizi. That collection was the first collection that the Indian students always studied in the, in the uh, Indian tradition. They would study that one first and then they would do the collection of the six. So these six collections that come and become canonical and really four are the most important ones in terms of the fiqh. You have Imam al-Bukhari is the, is the first and then Imam Muslim. The difference between the two, they have really rigorous criteria but there was one criteria that al-Bukhari uh, superseded Imam Muslim with even though he was Muslim was his student. And that is that Imam al-Bukhari had to absolutely be certain that the scholar in the chain, that he was in the city or the place and took from the person. He had to ascertain that there was a luqya, that they actually met and then taraqqa anhu, that he relate, relates from him. If it didn't have that criteria, he didn't accept it. Imam Muslim, it was enough for him that he was a thiqa and that he knew they were in the same area at the same time. He didn't have to absolutely ascertain the, um, the, 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 the meeting of the two. And that's why his is slightly less, but not that much. And, and there's a lot of crossover in the two. I mean, they, they both, uh, Im, Im, Imam uh, Sahih Muslim has more in his collection, even though he has only uh, 54 uh, chapters, he has less. Uh, more hadith than Imam al-Bukhari. So then you have Imam al-Tirmidhi is, is the next, uh, who's, who's extremely important, and this is his, his, uh, his jami'ah. This is a really important collection because this is where they begin to really want to get the hadith that are directly related to uh, ahkam especially, and, and, and things that the fuqaha are going to need. They say the muhaddithun are sayadila and, and the fuqaha are the atibba. So, so the, the muhaddithun are like the, the, the pharmacists. They prepare the, the drugs, right, the medicine, but it's the, it's the doctor who uh, diagnoses and then um, prescribes. So they see the, the muhaddithun aren't necessarily fuqaha. Uh, and this is something that is really important distinction in our tradition. There's a lot of mistakes that are made because we don't differentiate between a da'iyah and a faqih and a mutafaqi like a musharik fil fiqh, um, a muhaddith, a qari. Um, in Al Azhar, they actually have different colors on their turbans to determine who the qurra are. In other words, they just memorize Quran, they're not really ulama. So, so a lot of confusion is created from this. And then the word alim is a word that traditionally was not given easily to call somebody a alim. Alama was even more rare because uh, somebody who's an alama really genuinely will know most of the sciences of Islam. Um, and, and it's something that a really brilliant person with a very prodigious memory could, could do. Our tradition can be mastered. I mean, they can't know everything, but it can be mastered. And there are masters. They'll tend to be, have some area of expertise, like usul al-fiqh or tafsir. But if you look at somebody like Qurtubi, Qurtubi, is, he, he knows hadith, he knows tafsir, obviously. He, he's a faqih, you know, he knew the qiraat. I mean, all of these, he knew sirah, he knew tarikh, all these sciences. So the, the, 
the great ulama of our tradition are polymaths. And that's really important to remember. The du'at are more, you know, they're people that, they might have some level of knowledge, but, but they're more people that preach the religion to, and they're, they're storytellers, the qas. I mean, there's a famous story of Imam Malik radiallahu anhu, Yahya ibn Yahya Laythi on his way to Medina to study with Malik, was in a caravan, and there was a very pious man in the caravan who used to get up after the prayers and he would do a wa'adh, he would do exhortation. And people would cry, like he had a real effect on people. And uh, but when they got to Medina, they went into the masjid and when the prayer ended, he got up to do that and, and, and the little kids started throwing things at him. And then they took him out of the masjid. And Yahya ibn Yahya Laythi asked, like, what, ha what happened? And he said, Imam Malik doesn't allow qa uh, the qusas, like a qas, a storyteller, he doesn't allow them in the masjid of the Prophet. There's no storytellers. Because it was a place of ilm, tafsir, hadith. It wasn't a place of, uh, you know, the wa'ad is on Friday, but it's not, you don't get up and do those. So that, that, that was the early period. They didn't, they didn't really look too, uh, too kindly at these type people that were more shabby people. They were very serious about their knowledge. So Imam Malik radiallahu anhu, um, No, let me, let me backtrack. Um, Yahya ibn Yahya Laythi, then when he went to Malik's uh, majlis, um, he was there studying, and somebody came in with news that there an elephant in the caravan had come into the city. So everybody ran out to see the elephant. And Imam Malik looked at Yahya ibn Yahya Laythi, and he said, don't you want to see the elephant? He said, I didn't come from Spain. To, to see elephants, I came. <laughs> yeah, I came here to learn. And Malik da'alahu. So he, his recension, and he wasn't the most learned. I mean, Shaybani is more learned uh, than Yahya ibn Yahya Laythi. But his recension has the tawfiq. So it's the one that got this tawfiq. So, so the, uh, the, you have to have dabt, the naqal, um, and, and, and these were the criteria for the, uh, the, the soundness of the hadith. And Imam al-Bukhari, uh, even though he has about 160 of the mu'allaq uh, truths, they've all been shown to be, uh, that they, they're, they're all connected by chains. So everything in there is considered sahih. Somebody is, one of these horrible people that love to follow everything I do and then try to find mistakes and, and then put it up on, they do these little clips. They put this thing where I said that the al-Bukhari wasn't, uh, the, the, you know, wasn't everything in it wasn't sahih. That's not true, I never said that. What I said is ahad hadith are probable hadith, which is why they're not used according to the majority of our ulama in aqidah, right? There are many ahad hadith in, in the sahih collection. It doesn't mean they're not sahih, they are sahih. But there's always a possibility in the Ahad Hadith that there could be error because they're human beings. The, the Hadith tradition does not have the hivl of the Qur'an. And, the, and every, every Muslim in our tradition has recognized that, which is why there are fabricated Hadith, there are weak Hadith, there are Hassan Hadith, and then there are Sahih Hadith, and then there's uh, really strong Sahih Hadith like Mutafaq Ali, and then there's Mutawatir Hadith which have the same maqam as the Ayah of Quran, if it's Mutawatir, which is a small number of Hadith that are what we would call historically factual. A Mutawatir Hadith is like a historical fact. It's just too many people related that it could have been made up. And, and, and they've been collected. Imam Siyuti has a collection of that. Uh, there, 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 uh, there are a few, uh, Imam al-Qatani did a collection of the mutawatir hadith. So, so, but there are not that many that are mutawatir. So that's just important to note. This, it's an absolutely sahih collection. There's no doubt about that. We, we shouldn't have any doubt uh, about the hadith uh, that's in Sahih al-Bukhari. But in terms of aqidah, that then there's a higher standard because it's about God. And so there's not going to be any room for mistakes uh, when, when it comes to uh, 
uh, and that's why our aqidah is first and foremost, you know, Quran is the, is, is, is the foundation of the aqidah in our tradition. The rational creed, which you study here, is the whole purpose of a rational creed, which are the ilahiyat and the nabuwat, not the sam'iyat, because the sam'iyat are not part of the rational creed. It's the ilahiyat and, and the nabuwat. These are based on the human intellect. In other words, what are the attributes absolutely necessary for God? What, 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 will the, what will reason determine to be absolutely necessary for the ultimate being, the ultimate reality? And that's where they, uh, you get these 20 attributes. That's where they come from. Even though they're substantiated by the Quran, they're actually rational arguments. And the idea behind that is you don't fall into a circular reasoning. That was, that was the purpose of that. It's to get people out of a circle. Why do you believe in God? Because the Quran says so. Well, how do you know that's true? Because God, you know, God revealed the Quran. You get into a circular reasoning. So that's why taqlid, this idea of taqlid, like to know God and his messenger with nadar, like to actually think about it, to get out of taqlid. So that, that was something um, you know, that our ulama said, that we, we need to have absolutely sound hadith without any probable error in them. Other than that, the, uh, the second thing that I would point out about Imam al-Bukhari is the Sahih tradition is in some ways a reaction to Imam uh, al-Shafi'i. Because Imam Shafi'i departed from his teacher's methodology. So the, t the methodology of Imam Madik was that he would actually prefer, he would take the amal of the people of Medina over solitary hadith. This is called amal ahl al Medina. His argument was if he found, and he had 600 uh, teachers from the tabi'in in, 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 in in his lifetime. The argument was if he found dozens of the tabi'in doing the same practice, then he would, he would he, for him, they saw it from the Sahaba in Medina because there's 10,000 people buried there. So he, he saw it from the Sahaba. So he's saying, I'm, I'm going to take the fact that the righteous people are fasting on Friday, and there's a solitary hadith where Naha Rasulullah an al-Siyam yawm al-Jumu'ah, he said, I don't feel comfortable going to that solitary hadith and, and, and rejecting something that all of the people here saw the Prophet doing. Maybe the hadith was abrogated. Maybe the hadith was uh, khasisa, it was for a specific person. He, he preferred the amal, and that's why it's mutawatir for him. Imam Shafi'i didn't agree with that when he went to Iraq and then to Egypt. So he actually and famously said, Ida sah al hadith wa huwa madhabi. You know, but that, that is not, shouldn't be taken blanket the way a lot of modern people take that. It shouldn't be taken like that. So Imam Shafi'i, radiallahu he wanted to find the soundest uh, uh, opinion, for, uh, soundest hadith to base that judgment on. Imam Malik would take a sahih hadith, but he would prefer, like, the, the Adhan in Medina is different from the Adhan in Mecca. And he was asked about it. And he said, I don't know what they do in Mecca, but here's what they do here. And that's why the Adhan of, of the Malikis is different from the Adhan that's done in other parts of the Muslim world. Many other examples of that with Imam Malik. So, in response to that, the idea was, let's, let's find the soundest hadith, collect them all, because there were... Uh, Traditions where Imam Madik, for instance, Ibn Wahbin, who was one of Madik's students, Ibn Wahbin, uh, once that somebody asked Imam Madik about, you know, uh, going between the toes in the uh, in the wudu, and he made a remark, and then Ibn Wahbin said that he has a hadith that he got from Medina, uh, from uh, Egypt, that he recited, in the, and Malik said, I didn't know that hadith. 
And so that's one of the arguments of the Ahl al-Hadith is that the Imams didn't know all the Hadith of Ahkam. But if you look, and it's re this is really important to remember, because this is one of the big uh, confusions about our uh, modern Muslims. The madhabs are not the isolated opinions of the Imams. The Hanafi madhab is not the opinion of Abu Hanifa always, but it's the methodology of Abu Hanifa. The madhab of Imam Malik is not the opinion necessarily of Malik. Malik's opinion, for instance, was you didn't raise your hands uh, in dua. He didn't raise his hands in dua. That's his opinion. Malik's opinion was uh, that Quran does, does not benefit the dead. So uh, he doesn't recite Fatiha in the janazah. Salat al-janazah. So, so the, there are many examples of this in... Uh, you know, So, so uh, that's a big problem is people don't know that the Imams, it's a school with a methodology. All of the hadith of Ahkam are known by all four madhabs. They know all the hadith. It's, it's a matter of what's the methodology to determine that. So Abu Hanifa radiallahu has his methodology. So he won't take a hadith related to fiqh for instance uh, of Abu, Hanif, of, uh, Abu Huraira if it differs from his methodology. But why? Because he's not amongst the fuqaha of the, of the Sahaba. So these are the methodologies that if we don't learn the methodology of our uh, madhab, we won't understand why they differ from the other madhabs. And you won't appreciate the ikhtidaf. So it's one of the great blessings of the, uh, the ummah is the ikhtidaf. And, and, and we, getting back to what I said about not having the majami' in the history of Islam, we, were, we are the only world religion that has a normative tradition with such difference of opinion. No, no other religion has that, a world religion. Judaism is arguably a religion for one ethnic group. But in terms of the world religions, we're the only one that our normative tradition is, incorporates difference of opinion. The Christians had to split because they, couldn't, they could not absorb difference of opinion in one, in one normative tradition. So you have Catholics and Protestants. And then the Protestants, because they, their methodology, they opened up a myriad of sectarianism. So this book, um, which inshallah I wanted to, uh, to go over, I, I read this book with uh, Sheikh Muhammad Ali Aqoubi um, in its entirety, and it's, it's one of my favorite books. He also wrote a beautiful commentary on this, Ibn Abi Jamra, who was an Andalusian originally, but he ends up in Egypt. He's from the famous tribe of Al-Azd, which is one of the great Yemeni tribes. His student is Ibn al-Hajj al-Abdari, who was a great scholar from, originally from Fez, who ends up in Egypt. And Ibn Abi Jamra, one of the most beautiful stories about him was Ibn al-Hajj came to him and said he wanted to study with him. And he, he said, I, I don't have anything to teach you. He said, no, 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 you, I, I want to study with you. And he kept coming back and finally Ibn Abi Jamra said to him, I will, um, I'll sit with you and, we, and uh, under one condition, we study together and, and Allah is our teacher. That was the condition that he stipulated. He's a very humble man. He, uh, he wrote this book. It has a tawfiq that's amazing. He, he did it because he wanted people to memorize at least something from Al-Bukhari. And then he did an amazing commentary called Bahjat al-Nufus. In, in our tradition, we have what are called blurbs, where somebody writes something like, oh, you should um, read this book because it's amazing. He has 70, at the end of his book, he has 70 visions of the Prophet ﷺ, where people saw the Prophet ﷺ and told, and, and, they, and, and the Prophet ﷺ told them 
if you want to understand my sunnah, then read Ibn Abi Jamra's uh, commentary on Al-Bukhari. 70 visions from all different. So he wrote this uh, book. Uh, he, he's, he's an amazing uh, scholar. And um, and he begins it. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qal al-Abd al-Faqir. Antum al-Fuqara. Allah tells us that we're all. So, Qal al-Abd al-Faqir ila Rabbihi Abdullah ibn Sa'ad ibn Abi Jamra al-Azdi. Rahimu Allah ta'ala. Alhamdulillah haqqa hamdihi. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadan al-Khirata min khalqihi. Wa ala sahabati al-Sadat al-Mukhtarin li sahbatihi. So, beginning with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and prayers upon our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the choicest of his creation and upon his sahaba, the sadat al-mukhtarin, those chosen sada for his companionship. وَبَعَدْ فَلَمَّا كَانَ الْحَدِيثُ وَحِفْضُهُ مِنْ أَقَرْبَ الْوَسَائِرِ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ بِمُقْتَدَ الْآثَارِ فِي ذَارِكَ When the hadith study and memorization of the hadith is one of the quickest means to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based upon many uh, athar in that. فَمِنْهَا قَوْلُهُ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ مَنْ أَدَّ إِلَىٰ أُمَّتِي حَدِيثًا وَاحِدًا يُقِيمُ بِهِ سُنَّةً أَوْ يَرُدُّ بِدْعَةً فَلَهُ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever uh, delivers to my ummah one hadith that by it a sunnah is established or an innovation is refuted for him will be the paradise. وَمِنْهَا قَوْلُهُ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ مَنْ حَفِظَ عَلَىٰ أُمَّتِي حَدِيثًا وَاحِدًا كَانَ لَهُ أَجْرُ أَحَدًا وَسَبْعِينَ نَبِيًّا صِدِّيقًا I mean these again these are فَضَائِلَ الْعَمَالِ So وَالْأَثَارْ فِي ذَارِكَ كَثِيرَةٌ There are many athar. The ulama say that for weak you know hadiths that have weak that they're, they're good for the فَضَائِلَ الْعَمَالِ We don't use them for aqidah. We don't use them for um, ahkam. Uh, Ahmed al Hanbal used the Hassan hadith uh, he preferred, which in, at his time was called a Da'if hadith. So when people say, uh, Hassan yufadr al uh, Imam Ahmed yufadr al Da'if ala al Qiyas, is not totally accurate. In any case, Fadail al Amad, there are many hadiths that are beautiful and, 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 uh, and useful, and they're not thrown out for that reason. The modern kind of reaction against weak hadith. Is, uh, is not something that w w was part of the Ummah traditionally. The, the fuqaha were very rigorous about ahkam, but in things like um, these type of hadith, they, they were um, much easier with them. الْهِمَمْ قَدْ قَصُرَتْ So he says, I've seen the himam have weakened. So he's already saying this. Ibn Abi Jamra, right, um, he dies 699. So he's already saying people's, uh, their hymn is weak. In fact, when he said, he, he, he related a hadith about all the signs of the end of time, and he said, we, all, we see all these signs now, now in our time. So he's 699 in Egypt, and he's already seeing the signs of the end of time. So, and that's why Imam uh, al Laqani says, Because the himam are weak, abridgments are necessary these days. Hence, he took uh, the uh, Al-Bukhari and abridged it to a much shorter version here. So he said, So, قَصَرَتْ الْهِمَمْ عَنْ حِفْضِهَا مَعْ كَثَرَةِ كُتُبِهَا مِنْ أَجْلِ أَسَانِيدِهَا There's a lot of books now and they have all these chains. فَرَأَيْتُ أَنْ أَخُذَ مِنْ أَصَحِهَا كِتَابًا وَاخْتَسِرُ مِنُ أَحَدِيثٍ بِحَسَبِ الْحَاجَةِ إِلَيْهَا So I considered to take the soundest book and then abridge it based on the need of the hadith وَاخْتَسِرُ أَسَانِيدَهَا And to shorten their chains. مَا عَدَى رَاوِيَ الْحَدِيثِ فَرَبُدَّ مِنْهُ Except for the rawi because he said that's فَلَبُدَّ مِنْهُ And traditionally, I mean, may Allah forgive us, but traditionally, you know, hadith should be uh, related with the, at least the rawi. You know, that was, that was uh, the tradition. Um, 
فيسهل حفظها وتكثر الفائدة فيها إن شاء الله تعالى فوقع لي أن يكون كتاب البخاري لكونه من أصحها ولكونه رحمه الله تعالى كان من الصالحين وكان مجاب الدعوة ودعا لقارئه It said that when the fitna broke out he actually made a dua um, and he asked Allah to take him فقبني uh, إليك and, and the only time I've ever seen in any uh, of our tradition where the Prophet made dua for death was in time of fitna. Right? وَإِذَا أَرَدْتَ بِالنَّاسِ فِتْنَةً فَقْبِدْنِي إِلَيْكَ غَيْرَ مَفْتُونَ So take me to yourself. In other words, if civil war is about to break out, let me die before, before I see it. So he saw the fitna and he made a dua. Within one month he was dead. And he relates in the Sahih, لا يتمنى أحدكم الموت. None of you should desire death, right? Um, but the uh, because of some harm that afflicted him. The 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 commentators say, Imam Shinawi says that it's because the darar that you should never ask to to go back to Allah is worldly. But if it's otherworldly, right, then that's actually permissible. That's what, that's what he said. That's how they kind of get him out of that um, contradiction. وَقَدْ قَالَ لِي مَنْ لَقِيْتُهُ مِنَ الْقُضَاةَ الَّذِينَ كَانَتْ لَهُ مِنْ مَعْرِفَةِ وَالْرَحْلَةِ And one of the judges who I knew who had both knowledge and also had traveled Right, so it wasn't provincial. أَمَّنْ لَقِيَ مَنَ السَّادَةِ الْمُقَرِّ لَهُمْ بِالْفَضْرِ إِنَّ كِتَابُ الْبُخَارِ مَا قُرِيَ فِي وَقْتِ فِي وَقْتِ شِدَّةٍ إِلَّا فُرِّجَتْ وَلَا رُكِبَ بِهِ فِي مَرْكَبٍ فَغَرِقَتْ قَطُّ That he said, he heard from this man who had ma'rifa and also traveled, that and he was well known for his virtue. That al-Bukhari is a book that if you re read it during times of tribulation, that's why. Uh, Sheikh Muhammad, he revived that tradition, Sheikh Muhammad Yaqubi, uh, of doing the khatam of Al Bukhari, because there's a great benefit in doing it for removal of trials and things. Um, and he says, if, if it's on a boat, it's not going to, um, it's not going to drown. Uh, the, the ship won't go down. And he said, I wanted, because of the barakah that's in hadith, and because of what's the heart of oxidation, of this rust that gets in the hearts, that maybe by the bounty of Allah, it will remove the rust on the heart, and it will remove these difficulties of these uh, impulses and desires. Uh, that are distancing us from Allah. And perhaps that it will save us from drowning in the seas of innovations and sinfulness. <clears throat> so he, he begins it with the hadith of wahi beginning, how wahi began. And he ends it with the hadith about the people getting into paradise. And that's why he called it wa like c collecting this ultimate collection in the goodness of the beginning and also the goodness of the end. So the goodness of the beginning is revelation coming back to humanity through the Prophet, and the goodness of the end is the end of our lives. And uh, I, I, today, Dr. Janner, I thought, s said something really important that, I, that I got me thinking. He talked about um, that when we collectivize calamities, like when we look at we, we hear about people, 10,000 people died, or now 30,000 people. He said that we forget that there's no collective death. Like when you talk about 3,000 people died on 9-11, or a million people died in Afghanistan, 
those numbers are, they don't have real meaning because the reality of it is each one of those was an individual death. It was a human being confronting their mortality and experiencing it at that moment. And that was uniquely theirs. And it was decreed for them. And there was no way they could escape it. And so this great gift that we've been given, which is guidance from the Prophet it's just important to remember that everybody is living an individual life in a collective experience. We're all here together, but we're all experiencing the world through our own unique lens, which is why one of the beautiful statements in that book, in that poem about wisdom, you know, you know, of knowing what none has known before. Each one of you has a unique journey to Allah, and you will know in a way that no other human being in human history has ever known because it's your unique knowledge, it's your unique awareness, it's your unique experience. And so it's, it's a great blessing that, that we have connection with a man who died in, in 699. And he was, he was concerned about the weakness of the people of that time and, and all these people that were lost in sinfulness and in innovation and these things. And then he, he, he wanted to write a book. That was his niya. And this is one of the great salihin. So his niya was that it would revive people and help them. So I named it in accordance with the reason, the intention why it was put down. So that's one of the blessings of these books is that they make these du'as. And he, he was mujabid du'a. These are people whose, whose prayers were answered. So he said that, you know, my hope is that Allah will complete it for me and for anyone who reads it or hears it that the beginning of khair and the end of khair will be theirs. The beginning of khair is the revelation and the end is entering Jannah. You know that it, it removes, remover of things. And for the diseases of our religion, a healing. وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله. so that's the introduction. Um, any questions? anybody? أحمد خان. Um, yeah. uh, Sheikh, can you explain in the Maghribi tradition how they study hadith um, from like from from the beginning until the end? You know the the Mauritanians, for instance, uh, in Mauritania, they hadith comes very late. Um, so I mean, obviously, they there's a lot of hadith in the books. There's hadith in the books of grammar. There's hadith in the books of balagha. There's hadith in the in the books of uh, you know, that they read in fiqh and in different subjects. But w when they actually do study the hadith, and traditionally in Mauritania, they tended to go outside of Mauritania to read the hadith. So they would go to Morocco um, and, they, and they would read. Um, today, uh, Sheikh uh, Abdullah Wad Ahmed memorized Al Bukhari in my house, the whole thing, <laughs> when, he, when, when he was living with me. Alhamdulillah, he has an amazing himma. Um, so, and because they have, the ulama of Mauritania have very strong Arabic, because one of the biggest problems with the Hadith tradition is the, uh, the, a lot of the, um, a lot of mistakes in the books, a lot. It's not like Quran. In fact, it's a miracle of the Quran, because in Surah Al-Hijr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lawla hafidhun. That we reveal this book and we will guard it. It's amazing, you won't find Qurans in the Muslim world that have mistakes in them. It's one of the miracles of the Quran. 
like you go from Indonesia to the United States, you find an Arabic Quran and it doesn't have mistakes in it. Whereas the Hadith, it doesn't have that protection. So they're, 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 and then the Hadiths are difficult because there are different uh, riwaya. So sometimes, like in the first Hadith, in, in, it says, uh, I mean, all, 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 all of those all are um, related. So sometimes you have to um, navigate just the different uh, riwayat in the same in the same hadith. So, so th that's how they traditionally they, they now they've begun to uh, do to study the Quran because there's been a revival. I mean, the hadith because there's been a revival. In Morocco, also there was much more focus on Quran and on fiqh. So, so when you look at the West, West African tradition, the Maliki tradition in particular, Imam Malik separated hadith and fiqh. So his fiqh class was not his hadith class. His hadith class was completely separate. Moreover, he didn't mention hadith in his fiqh class. So he did, there was no, you know, like they say, what's your delil? You couldn't say that in Imam Malik's class, what's your delil? He was the delil. So, so, so that's part of the, the uh, you know, من يريد الله به خيرا يفقه في الدين You know, the, the idea of understanding of the religion. So the hadith traditionally was, it was really an area of the ulama more than it was the common people. Imam al-Nawawi radhi anhu wrote the 40 hadith and, and the Riyadh al-Sariheen for more just for people like in masjids, you know, people read these hadiths and they're wild and they're, they're agreed upon hadith. There's not, although in the Arba'in hadith, there is a problem in the hadith, Umirtan Uqatir al Nas, because people read that. And, the, you know, Ibn Abi Jamr has the, a brilliant explanation because it's in this collection also. Um, but he, he said that hadith is, be, uh, it's, it's, the, it's from the khasais of the Prophet. Sallallahu He's the only one that was allowed to do that. And that's why he said Umirtu. He didn't say Umirtum. He said Umirtum. Like he, that's unique to him. And it was only for the, uh, the Arabian Peninsula. And there's an argument it was only for the Hijaz. Because the Hijaz has a, you know, it's a sacred space. So um, that, that's, that's uh, important to note. So, but in, 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 in Morocco, they, they study. I mean, they have great uh, muhadithun. Uh, Abdullah Taridi revived that with, his, I mean, his teachers, the Ghumari brothers. Um, who were all muhaddithun and, and very accomplished muhaddithun. So, and they have the still chain and senad. But they tend to read that Bukhari, they read the Muatta, and they read Sahih Muslim. They don't have the tradition that the Indians have of doing the sitta. So in India, you know, and, and probably the, the, the Indians are the last community that really, um, they've held to that tradition of the ulama have to go through the collection. All six, uh, all six. Um, and they use the, they in the Indian tradition. Traditionally, they began with um, the Mishkat al Masabih, which is late, but is a, a brilliant collection because it gives you a really good. I mean, one of my favorite books is the uh, Ahadith al uh, Muntakhaba, which is by Muhammad Elias uh, for the six points. It's a brilliant book. It's one of the best collections for just you know, average Muslims to be educated about the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then they would do uh, Tirmidhi first. And then they would do Abu Dawud because they related to fiqh more. And then Al-Bukhari, and then Muslim, and, and then um, they would end with uh, Ibn Majah, and Nasa'i, and then Ibn Majah. So those were the six. And Nasa'i has two, he has his longer version which had a lot of unreliable hadiths, but his uh, mujtaba is, uh, it's actually after probably at Bukhari and Muslim, you know, it's his, he has a very rigorous um, criterion. Any other?
Assalamu alaikum. So um, for Hajid ibn Asqalani, who is a big scholar too on Hadith, I came across his book, Bulug al-Maram, Bulug and how that was yeah. like very beautiful, how he put together, I guess that was for like faqadis, for judges or something, but I saw a lot of different Hadiths that I wouldn't see in other um, books. Yeah. I don't know if you could speak a little more about that, but yeah. also um, the, my other part question is two parts. Um, when I read like certain books, such as like um, certain scholars, they would claim that they're Maliki or Ashari, but then at some point they reach a mujtahid level. Mm. And can like what what level uh, yeah. this person have to go through that, and how do they arrive to that? Yeah. So so about the Burugh and Muram, uh, there's two two uh, books that are very popular in that genre, which is what are, what are called Ahadith al-Ahkam. So these are Ahadith like Umd al-Ahkam, al-Maqdisi. Um, th that and Bulugh al-Muram are both used. So they're very similar, but they have the majority of Hadith that are used. Because when you, when you look at the, the, um, the, the Ayat al-Ahkam and the Hadith that relate to fiqh rulings, they're not that many. Because many, many uh, rulings, I mean, I once asked him, when I was, probably, I was probably like 20 years old, and I asked one of the, I had read that Imam al-Awza'i, afta bi sab'ina alf masada bi qarallah wa qala rasulullah. Like he, he, I mean, it might be an exaggeration, I don't know, but I read a biography of uh, Imam al-Awza'i when I, when I was very young, when I was in the Emirates studying. And Hisham al-Burhani had done his, um, uh, PhD on fiqh al-awza'i and he was one of my teachers so I read this uh, biography one of the things I remember from it which I really liked was uh, he, he was on his way to because he was from Syria but he was on his way to Beirut and uh, he came to a fork in the road and there, was, and there was a cemetery and there was an old woman sitting uh, on the side of the road and he didn't know which one went to Beirut and he said ayyuhuma lil ma'mura meaning the city. Ma'mura means the place where people are living. And she said, Al-Ma'mura huna. Like, and she pointed to the graveyard. <laughs> if you want the graveyard, you can go there. Like, and he took it as an ishara that they needed ihya, like to, that he went to revive the city. And he did. And they say that um, thousands, tens of thousands of people came Muslim the day he died. A lot of Christians and everything. There were so many people out. In any case, um, uh, that was a little detour. Um, so so though the, the, the books of Ahkam, the one Ibn Hajj's book and the one uh, of Imam al-Maqdisi, those were very common. Um, and, and they have generally commentaries by different madhabs. So, so we, ha we have like one of the Maliki scholars did a commentary on Umd al ahkam So he'll show you, oh, we don't agree with this for this reason. Um, so that's one of the things. Um, so it's important to, to, to not use these books to derive your rulings from, because that's the level of a mushtahid. So now you asked about the mushtahid. So th there's different levels of ishtihad. There's ishtihad, uh, ishtihad al mas'ala. You know, so you have an ishtihad of a mas'ala. Sheikh Muhammad Bufaris, Sheikh Talal. There's different scholars here that could do that, which is where you study one issue really well, and you really know it from a lot of different perspectives, and you come up with your, like the, uh, you know, uh, Yusuf Ismail, who, who will be the first to admit, you know, he's not a mujtahid, but he's doing ishtihad in the prayer times, right? Because, so, so in, in Masala, even a doctor can do that. There's ishtihad in tib, for instance, you know, those type things. That just means you're exhausting your efforts to try to understand a situation. Most of us are what are called muqallidun. Taqlid is that you follow somebody, but you don't know their dalil, but you know that they're trustworthy. So if I follow Malik, I'm trusting that Malik was a rightly guided Imam because all the Ummah says he was rightly guided. And so I trust him. So when Malik says, you know, in the Mudawana, they asked about holding the hands at the side uh, or, or doing qabalt. He said, لا, لا I don't know it in the faridah. So he saw it as a, you know, so 
most of the Madikis, the mashhur of the madhab is sadru yadin, like Ibn Asha says, that you leave the hands at the side. Um, the muttabi', which is a later uh, term, a muttabi' is somebody who, who follows the, the, the imam, but he knows the dalil, right? But they're not like a mujtahid. They just know, like if you ask them, why do you hold your hands at your side? They'll say, oh, because it's the amal of Ahl al Medina. Um, there's no sahih hadith for qabad. All of them have ilal, as been shown by the, 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 the fuqa of the Maliki, something like that. Like he'll, he'll know how to defend his position of not just being a blind follower. And then you have mujtahid, just fatwa, right? So somebody who has enough knowledge and they can do a, an ishtihad, like somebody comes and asks them for something. If they know the mashur of the madhab, they can just give the opinion. They're not a mujtahid, they're just a, a mufti. So they just give the opinion. But if they've studied enough to where they can, if a new issue comes up, they can actually examine the issue. Now, Sheikh Abdullah bin Biya has a haram, um, a triangle. He calls it fatwa alif, fatwa ba, and fatwa jim. Fatwa alif, he says, are those things that people that are educated in, the, in, in their madhab, in their school, they know the methodology of their teacher, that they can, if they get, a new issue comes up, if it's in the th areas, or they can give fatwa, then that, and then ba is, it means more like somebody who has to have a deeper knowledge. Uh, and then jim is, can't be done by individuals. It can only be done by government bodies, like declaring war. You can't, you can't have an individual declare war. Like I do, I declare war on California. This is a go, the, it create anarchy. So, and then you have mujtahid uh, madhab, which is somebody who's in uh, the madhab and he chooses, like Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi, he'll choose the preferred opinion for him as a mujtahid. So he'll look, and even though the, 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 the madhab might say that that, that fatwa is, is uh, marjuah, you know, like it's not the rajah, it's not the predominant one, it's, it's not mashhur. He'll say the delil's stronger with that. So he'll say, I'm going to do qabal, because I think, Imam Malik Yarwi an Sahar ibn Sa'ad fil Muwatta anna anna kana nas yu'maruna an yaj'alu al-yad al-yumna ali al-yusra fi salat so i'm going to take that hadith cuz i think that's the rajih position so that's mujtahid murajjah and then you have mujtahid muqayyad and that's somebody who actually that's like ibn al-qasim so those people are they've reached a level where they're a mujtahid but with, they're still using the usul of their, the madhab of their imam. And then finally you have mujtahid mutlaq. And that person is somebody who comes up with his own uh, uh, usul. So th those are, those are uh, like Abu Hanifa, Layth ibn Sa'ad, uh, Imam Abd Rahman al-Awza'i, uh, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, uh, Imam uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Imam al-Tabari, can you atabar min ha'ula? Uh, some say al-Bukhari was a mujtahid mutlaq. Some say he was shafi'i. The majority, uh, Tajidin al-Subki puts him in the tabaqat al-shafi'iyya. So Allahu alam. Um, he tends to, his opinions seem to co coincide with the shafi'i madhab. So there's a strong case that he was shafi'i. Although I once asked one of the Mauritanians how, why all the great muhaddithun were shafi'i. And he said, la, 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 and uh, Basir, yani, look a little deeper. He said, look at all Imam Nawi, who's he quoting? He's quoting all Malikis, like Ibn Abu Talib and Qadayyab. <laughs> These are just nukat. Yeah. Is that clear? Yeah. Taqlid's not a, it's a blameworthy state, but if it's your state, don't think, don't get above your, not your pay grade, but your prey grade. Yeah, you know, because people, we can't, the hadith are too, there's hadith that are, that are mutadariba. They, their, their hadith literally contradict each other. And they're both sahih. And so the ulama have all these ways of uh, trying to get uh, tawfiq between them. 
Is it Nasikh? Is it Mansur? Is there a way to interpret it in, in which uh, you know, they can be understood like that? So um, people go astray. Ibn Wahbin said, أَكْثَرْتُ مِنَ الْحَدِيثِ حَتَّى تَحِيَّرْتْ وَلَوْ لَا لَيْثٌ وَمَارِكْ لَهَلَكْتُ I learned so many hadith, and he's one of the top men of Al Bukhari, Ibn Wahbin from, from Egypt. He said, I learned so many hadith, I became confused. And had it not been for Layth and Malik, I would have uh, perished. And he said, I went to Malik, you know, leave that one. That's not, there's no amal on that hadith. Khud hadha. And, and so he actually helped him uh, understand the, 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 the hadith. Yeah. I mean, partly I think one of the secrets of, is to force people to think because the thing about Islam, it's, it's a thinking person's religion. It's not a religion for dummies. I mean, you can be a dummy and be a Muslim. It's, you know, but, but the religion itself, the, the deen, it's, it's, not a, it's a religion. The Quran was revealed in a way, it's not a linear book. It's a book that needs deep ta'amul. The deeper you do the ta'amul, the more cohesion you see in it. But if you go to it just as a, as a book, a lot of people read it and they're like, what? It's like changing uh, tenses. It's changing first person, second person, third person, iltifat in balagha. You know, like they really have a difficult time. But the deeper you go into the Qur'an, the more cohesion there is. And it's been brought out by people like Imam al-Biqa'i and some of the great commentators, uh, Sahib Adwa al-Bayan, Qur'an bil Qur'an. I mean, a lot of the Qur'anic tafsirs are purely linear, but people like Ibn Zubair, al-Gharanati, uh, Imam al-Biqa'i, one of the great uh, Lebanese um, scholars, you know, they show that there's a deep tanasub in the Qur'an that can only be penetrated through deep study. And the hadith are like that. They force people to think. Um, yeah. Any other? Tafaddal. Shaykh, uh, would you recommend that we read hadiths on our own? Or like, would you advise against it? I would advise against it unless you have a level of Arabic grammar. Um, that's good. Um, I, I would advise against it. Um, I think Riyadh al-Salihin, Arba'in and Awi, but you still need commentary, and it's best to read hadith with a teacher initially. It really is. The, I think the Quran for Ibadah, the Quran, but uh, yeah, I think um, a lot of trouble has been caused because people went directly to the, uh, the hadith. It's created a lot of confusion in the modern world, um, Muslims. And, and because all the books are accessible, traditionally, you know, they called it wijada in, in, the, uh, in, the, in our hadith tradition. Wijada was people that found books and read them without being in a chain, without studying. Um, so uh, it's traditionally, I mean, they didn't permit it. The, 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 the ulama but you know uh, over time because the, if, if, if like Sheikh Muhammad Yaqubi may Allah preserve him he revived the, uh, the amazing Istanbul uh, publication of Al-Bukhari which is the, the best one of all the printed editions so he actually reprinted that recently and wrote an amazing uh, introduction to that um, if you have a really good sound, um, I, the deal band have good, uh, they're, they're, they're not well published, but they're actually well uh, edited. Dar um, al-Minhaj, like this, this uh, edition of um, the Mukhtasar of Sahir Bukhari is, is well edited. But you still every once in a while find mistakes. So... You know, and if so, if you don't know, and then also Imam Dhabi famously, you know, uh, the the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, "Man kadab alayya mutaamidan, fal yatabawa maqadhu min al-nar." You know, um, whoever 
mm, you know, lies about what I said intentionally, he should take his seat in hell. And that's a mutawatir hadith. So, so it's multiply transmitted. It's a, absolutely sound, factual hadith. It's as valid as any verse in the Quran. That should give people pause, you know, just because it's very serious. And, um, you know, it, he actually said that he would fear that somebody who, who did not know grammar and quoted hadith with lahan. And may Allah forgive us, because I, I know I've done that in the past. So, um, but he said that he would, he would be afraid that they would fall into that category of people telling a lie because the Prophet never uh, had, had a solecism. He never ever used bad grammar. His, his grammar was perfect. <laughs> so, so one should know nahu and sarf. Especially, I mean, sarf is the problem with a lot of hadith. Nahu is relatively easy, as you guys are learning, just in terms of i'rab. It's not that difficult. But sarf is a problem, you know, and also the, just the different, would you guys agree? Yeah. <laughs> because there's just, um, there's a lot of different, is it hazana yahzunu, is it hazina yahzanu, is it hazuna yahzunu? I mean, they're all possibilities. So if you just see ha, zay, noon, which one is it? And uh, I mean, fortunately, a lot of these are well um, commented on. So there are great commentaries. And, and very often they will give us, they'll tell, you know, this is uh, like, Alawazni um, Nasar Yansuru. So they'll tell you what it is. If it's like Rajafa Yarjufu, you know, Rajafa Yarjufu Fuaduhu, Atta Khadija to Khadija Ta, Radila Anha, Wa Yarjufu Fuaduhu. So they'll say in the commentary, Rajafa. Because everybody knows Nasara Yansuru, but not everybody might know Rajava Yarjufu. Alhamdulillah. Subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, shadow la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk wa al-asri anna l-insana ala fi khusr illa al-ladhina aman wa amiru salihati wa tuwasaw bil-haqqi wa tuwasaw bil-sabar Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamu ala mursalim wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen I'll do inshallah when we do the next session the musalsal bil-awwaliya so it'll be haqiqatan as opposed to idafatan because the, the ulama differ on the musalsal. Is it musalsal bil awaliya haqiqatan or idafatan? So if, if it really is the first one you heard uh, from the person, then it's haqiqatan. Yeah.